So again, I uh, want to thank everyone for coming to uh, Austin Langchain User Group, our Langchain 101 talk. I um, want to give you a little heads up about uh, Austin Langchain User Group, but first want to uh, uh, invite everyone to explore um, the, the interface that we have. So um, for my work, I was, I was able to score a, a license for, um, you know, it's called a, a sessions license, so like a 500 seat sessions license. So I created a different uh, workspace for Austin Langchain. And so we have now we have a place where we can collaborate online, we can do um, virtual or virtual meetings, and we can also use this as our um, as a platform for internally. Let me see. I want to encourage everyone to just take a quick poke around uh, the interface. So on your bottom right hand side, uh, you should see a couple buttons. Uh, there's a participants link, which should link to uh, everyone who is um, here. We have a chat window, and that chat window, there is a, uh, a group chat as well as private. So I'll go ahead and say hello, everyone. We have a, actually, I can actually, oh, I think my interface might be the same as yours. So let me see if I can actually share my screen and do this one. Okay, cool. Um, we'll ignore that. So we have the, the chat on the right so we can chat with each other. Um, you're welcome, Tony. Um, we have some polls that we will be throwing up here and there. Uh, I think we can give those to you. We have a Q&A. So uh, please, if there's any questions, you know, Queue them up through the Q and A. Um, that'll allow us to go ahead and pick and choose uh, which ones we want to pull, pull them back in the session. Um, the notes is, I believe, your your personal notes, and you can connect them into your Notion and Evernote. If you click takeaways, we have preloaded this with links to our repo, a direct link to the presentation, uh, a link to our meetup. Um, and uh, the direct links to the collab interfaces of the labs that we'll be doing today. And uh, there is also a transcript um, that will be uh, a running transcript that will be transcribed, uh, as well as a recording for this. Now, anyone who has registered and attended will have access to the recording, uh, as well as all the transcripts and whatnot. Also really cool things, um, uh, there's an API interface to all of this, so in future labs, uh, we'll be able to pull in um, pull in this cool stuff into our AI microservices for our fun. So on that, that's the, the tour of the interface. And if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the q and I'm still learning this myself, so you know, bear with me. Okay, let's stop the share screen and let's go ahead and share a presentation instead. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off and make sure that everyone can see things properly. Um, can I, if in the chat, people, people can uh, everyone see this? Give me like a thumbs up. Cool. Thanks, Catherine. Okay. Um, so again, my name is Colin McNamara. Um, I, I am the organizer of the uh, Austin Lake Chain User Group. We are a group of uh, Langchain enthusiasts uh, based out of Central Texas uh, in, in Austin, uh, the coolest city in the world, if you ask us. Um, it's more like adult summer camp, but it's full of really great people, uh, real good hearts, really friendly, um, and a lot of fun things to do, including things like this. Uh, the Austin Langchain User Group, uh, again, is a group of users uh, of Langchain. It's an AI middleware software um, that we're going to be going over some basics of how to use today. Um, you can find us on our Discord. Um, Discord is to my left-hand side here. You know, people are uh, chatting on that as well. Let's keep our chats in here right now. Uh, but feel free to pop in the Discord, say hi. Um, we are on there. Um, there's always a few of us on there active um, throughout the day. Uh, it's really cool to see people posting about what they're doing, asking questions. Um, it's also a place where we come together and plan our both in-person and virtual events. Uh, our GitHub is listed here. Um, it's a, um, a repository on GitHub. Uh, our software is licensed as uh, Apache 2, and our content is lot licensed as uh, Creative Commons Attribution. Basically, this means you, you can use the code for whatever you want, the labs for whatever you want. You just can't sue us for patent infringement if you use that in your own software. 
as well as uh, the presentations, the content, you're free to, to give this yourself um, in your own in community, in your own business, uh, in your own consulting practice, whatever, we don't care. Um, we are embracing learning in the open. Uh, this is a fast moving project in a fast moving field. Um, and there's the power of learning together. Um, we have our meetup, uh, meetup group link, which is there. Um, and, uh, and the YouTube channel. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I forgot to put that in there. Um, we will be producing, uh, this latest, uh, latest update and throwing that on, um, throwing that up on the YouTube. So one cool thing about this tool is it should keep a, a better, um, there, Catherine, this said the screen is a bit small. Um, how can I make that bigger? I don't know how to make that bigger just yet. Um, I will take that feedback though. That's my full screen. I don't know if that works better. Um, escape. Okay. Um, let me see. In it, hopefully that is that is a little bigger. If not, um, we'll go ahead and try to make this better the next time. Okay, a little about me. Uh, my name is my name is Colin McNamara. I live on the east side of Austin. Um, it's kind of uh, the hip, up and coming side with the great restaurants and whatnot. Um, a lot of really cool groups of people. Um, uh, for my day job, I am managing partner of engineering and finance at a consumer product development company uh, called uh, Always Cool Brands. Um, dealing with really fun stuff every day. Uh, my background uh, is in hyperscale cloud engineering and operations. I've spent 25 years of my life. Um, building pieces of and, and significant pieces of, as well as operating um, some platforms there. All of you use every day, and I still use every day. Uh, my my open source uh, story started with uh, Linux back in the late '90s. Um, moved on to open cloud platforms such as OpenStack, SDA platforms such as Open Daylight. Um, progressed into different platforms, and now we're here inside of um, LangChain, so open source AI. Uh, I'm using LangChain for business operations. Uh, again, so, you know, uh, this is AI middleware. I'll talk a little bit about how uh, I saw value in it and why I am uh, so eager to continue to learn that. Uh, you can find me on the internet uh, at colinmacmero.com. Uh, my LinkedIn's under there, too. Uh, I post some stuff to Twitter every once in a while. Um, and you can, again, find me on our Discord. But I'll start with a little story. So I'll ask you, how safe is your next flight? Uh, a couple of days ago, we might have seen uh, the um, Airbus, or excuse me, the 737 Max issue where uh, one of the door plugs blew off and, on its way out of Portland, um, and it kind of highlights aviation safety as something that's really important nowadays. Um, prior to that, we had uh, there's a, a distributor called AOG Technics uh, that introduced uh, forged documents and fake parts into the aviation uh, supply chain. So uh, what they did is they created 90 fake certificates on uh, bogus parts. It ended up in 126 engines. Uh, this ended up, I uh, believe, um, about 80 different Air Airbus airframes were affected. And these were these were airliners that were taking people around the world. Right? Uh, the, this fraud in the supply chain uh, exposed weakness in the parts market, but it really is representative of fraud in supply chain all around the world. You know, from, from our work, we build supply chains, we formulate products, you know, whether it's a juice box, whether it's cookies, whether it's a consumer product like a headphone that goes in your ear. Um, and there are great manufacturers out there and there are horrible manufacturers out there and there's everyone in between. Uh, and so for my use case, um, when as we're de designing private brand and, and private label products, um, for mainly focus on our customers for retail, grocery, uh, club store, and also influencer agencies. Uh, we've been formulating uh, nutraceuticals and, and different injectables uh, for uh, for some, you know medical influencers and stuff like that. Um, the work streams that we work in: uh, packaging, design, formulation, manufacturing, bulk material sourcing, and so. And we also were we have to deal with um, a lot of regulatory environments. So. ISO, safe quality few foods. We have to create assets for any ingestibles. Um, anything that's FDA uh, managed, we have to uh, maintain a CAPA process, a corrective and preventive action process. And uh, at times, we'll help um, help brands um, with uh, funding. And so and that may include selling off a portion of that brand, uh, which now triggers due diligence uh, with the SEC. So for us, uh, the first, first 
thing, the first time the LangChain peeked its uh, face into my world was uh, a, a RAG solution for due diligence. Uh, RAG is retrieval augment generation. It's basically a way that you can enrich um, an AI agent with a documents you pr present to it. Uh, for us, uh, this was really, really powerful. Um, I ended up building it at first because I wanted to make it easier to generate um, documents for, uh, for investors, right? So you generate your investment white, white papers, your thesis, your perspective, stuff like that. Um, what I found was that LangChain provided me a tool to clearly, clearly identify where questions were answered thoroughly and where they were not. Um, this identified fraud in my supply chain. Um, and thankfully, we're able to identify the fraud and uh, kick those people out, right? Kick those problem, those, pro those problem childs out. Or as I spilled water on my keyboard, let's see if this blows up our entire presentation or not. Okay, cool. So uh, again, uh, this provided a huge amount of value from a free and open source project. And it was actually pretty simple to do. Um, all we'll bring over a subset of the code that, that I use in our next in-person meetup, I believe next week, next Wednesday, as well as a uh, tying, and that was tying in Google Drive into this, and as well as an example that Ricky will be showing of how to use that using Langserve templates and like an AI microservice. Uh, net net uh, LangChain uh, protected me from an SEC violation, which is really, really good because uh, that's bad. Uh, but beyond that, um, it's enabling us to establish provenance uh, as we have as we source bulk materials all the way to product ends up on the shelves. Um, LangChain as a tool uh, enables us to consolidate information, but also um, put it put in scope three reporting um, and uh, scope three reporting for like sustainability issues, carbon carbon tracking stuff like that, um, as well as a bunch of other fun stuff. It's a really really powerful tool. I am a huge fan. Okay, so what is LangChain? Okay, so uh, LangChain is an open source. That means it's free and you can use the source code. Library for building LLM applications, uh, large language model applications. Uh, it is a fast moving project. <laughs> um, it, it's a fast moving open source project. It's founded by a really cool guy. Uh, his name is Harrison Chase. Uh, he's at HWChase17 on X. Um, and uh, it is the, the LangChain project is found uh, on langchain.com and langchain.dev. Uh, we treat this as an upstream project for our user group, um, and it is it is really amazing. It's moving really, really fast. Um, now, a really cool thing about Harrison Chase, uh, I believe uh, Harvard-educated, uh, focused on robotics, and uh, started writing LM applications and was finding in that when he, would, he was rewriting a whole bunch of code, as he was writing directly to APIs of like uh, GPT-4, so the back end of chat GPT and others, and so what he did is he started, he bundled the code that he was using for these common operations inside the LM, inside libraries that are consumable um, for everyone and shared it to the world. What a cool dude. Uh, he also got uh, funded by Benchmark and I believe his company is valued at $200 million right now. Really cool. Uh, the LangChain project uh, it has Python and TypeScript packages uh, and really is focused on composition modularity. Um, think of it as a Lego bricks or building blocks that um, allow us to um, to build our applications. So we can kind of cheat off his notes, cheat off their notes for on the team. So we'll talk a little bit, bit about LangChain um, key concepts. Let's check my chat, make sure I didn't miss anything when I'm breaking it. Cool, okay. Um, so our LangChain key concepts here. So on the fundamental uh, base of LangChain, and I don't know if you can see my, oh, you can, cool. Um, LangChain itself and the, core, and the core project itself um, is based on, um, again, uh, and we're talking about Python versus the, the JavaScript side, but for the Python side, so it's Python and JavaScript, right? And it has a base, uh, it, what it does is it composes uh, connectors into models. So models being um, the large language models on the back end um, that, you um, that are effectively compressed versions of the internet that act like smart little humans. Uh, it has the uh, LangChain has a bunch of different retrievers. So retrieval, re retrieval ob uh, ability to retrieve objects out of your uh, Google Drive, out of the internet, out of a vector store. Um, and there's different ways that you chunk data as it comes in. Um, has a uh, agent tooling. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. 
Um, but the, the ability for it to define like the personality of something that thinks and looks like a person, an autonomous agent that has tools that it can go ahead and um, do, do fun stuff with. There's a protocol layer in what's called length chain, ex uh, length chain expression language, uh, which allows you to, in a simple language, similar to um, a, a Linux command line or someone you use in Mac OS on the command line or a terminal to pipe certain chains together. That was really cool. And there's an application layer uh, where the chains, the agents, and the executors all tie together. On top of that is a templating la layer where predefined, uh, predefined uh, lang chain, um, effectively code, you can suck it down and do cool stuff with. You don't have to rewrite a bunch of stuff and you edit it. Um, there's lang serve, which is a, a presentation layer that allows you to present your AI microservices um, in, into your own applications. And then lang smith, which is a, um, a really a development environment and a debugging engine that um, I use there. I've been using more and more every day. It's really cool. Let's take a little bit deeper dive. Let's go into some key concepts. Let's talk a little bit about models. So what's a model? Um, fundamentally, what a model is, is a large language model is a compressed version of, uh, let's say the internet. Um, the 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 newer models are kind of derivative of each other, so you might train a model off a model. But all in all, this starts with what we saw on the internet and in, in natural language. And uh, with a lot of money and a lot of CPUs, uh, they're highly compressed down, right? There's two different types. There's uh, the uh, LM, the standard LMs that you got access to that answer very specifically to uh, queries that you put into it. And there's a chat model. Um, chat models are optimized to operate in simple natural language. So as you type something simple into it, it may come back with something really, really complex. It's a really good place to start with. Uh, many of us started with this in ChatGPT and um, many of us, uh, including me, use ChatGPT every day. Um, it's a really cool platform. Um, but what we'll be doing with LangChain is using the backend models behind ChatGPT. GPT-4, Turbo, GPT-3.5, and then actually later in this lab, we'll be using a private language model um, that uh, Kareem will be taking us through. So I won't even go out to the internet. Um, so the uh, continuing on the concept, uh, concepts, LangChain is an AI middleware uh, allows you to connect into many, many models. So again, like if you're using ChatGPT or maybe you're using uh, the, uh, uh, the new GPT agents, right? You're, you're connecting into one model in the back end, right? Most often GPT-4. Uh, structurally, in, behind ChatGPT, uh, it's about eight different models and some routers between it, but you know, won't get into that. But so LangChain supports 20 different LM integrations to so all sorts of different models, all sorts of ones publicly available on the internet, as well as ones you can download privately. Um, it supports 10 text embedding models, right? text embedding models are the ways when we suck information down on the internet, maybe we suck down a website or we pull in a PDF document or we pull in like our internal business processes we may have in our wiki, right? There's different ways that you can chunk them up and throw them into the vector store or, or embed them in, in, um, in, in, in a language which the LMs can understand, right? So it is a highly, a highly effective abstraction layer for this where, um, and we saw it's like Sam Altman got in a little pissing match with his board a while back, or I guess the, the, the flip side, now that we learn more. Um, but a lot of us saw the performance of, of, of GPT-4 drop, right? And so we had to make other choices for applications. Maybe we switched over to Anthropic. Maybe we switched locally to using a Llama, right? Um, LangChain allows us to do that very easily, very quickly, and have a composability in our applications. So uh, continue with our key concepts, uh, LangChain, has this notion of prompts. Now, if you've gone deeper into um, ChatGPT and you started prompt engineering, uh, one of the first things you learn is you need to tell the, the LLM like what it is. Because the LLM has been trained on the entire internet. And if you're asking for um, gluten-free vegan cookie recipes, well, yeah, you should tell it that. And if you're asking for um, systems engineering uh, commands to ensure that your, doc your, 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 your 
um, your, 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 uh, here, if you're if you if you if you're trying to figure out your Docker commands and you need systems engineering help, well, there's two different personalities that your LM uh, needs to have, and so you can help it out by saying you're you're a helpful AI that has expertise in DevOps tool chains, or you're a uh, a nutritional scientist that has uh, expertise in 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 formulating healthy recipes that uh, avoid seed oils, right? So in this case, the uh, the I have an example here of a chat template, and so these are things we can use inside LangChain where we can preload up these personalities. So as we're building our applications, we might want to build an application in this case that is a content rewriter. And so if you look in if you look in the code here, there's a system message, and oddly enough, this message goes to the system on the back end, right? And say, hey. You're a helpful assistant that rewrites the user's text to sound more upbeat. Now, if we scroll down, we can see that it's the LM equals chatty, chatty open AI. So that's the open AI chat interface. And that the um, we're passing all this stuff, the LM chat template, blah, blah, passing this text, which is the human said, I don't like eating tasty things. But on the system side, it says we want to write this text to be more upbeat. So the response, if we look on the bottom, is I absolutely love indulging in delicious treats. Now, this is a simple example, but you can use this very, very powerfully. Um, you can define multiple multiple templates. Um, you can reuse them. And these are things that um, you'll probably use every day. But one, the thing I really want to highlight, while there is some Pythonic code inside of here, to change the function of this application, you just have to change your system message, right? So really, really fun. So we defined, we, we, we explored what a prompt template was. Now, second, the next key concept we want to talk about is chains, right? So functionally, what we can do is we can chain these prompt templates together. So there's three different types of chains that we're probably going to, that you're going to run into most of the time. First one is very simple. It's a simple chain. So we take an input, we do something to that input, in this case, the input was, I, I don't like eating these things. The output was, I love tasty treats, right? And the chain, then you can pass that to chain two. And that input maybe, and that chain maybe make a joke about the text that's coming in, right? And, you know, what did the tasty treat say when it was walking down the road? You know, I don't know. I'm a tasty treat. I don't do these things, right? That can be the output, right? Next, we have se sequential chains. So we can pass input to multiple chains. So you may have a, a, multiple simple chains that you use that do a transformation. Maybe you do log analysis. Uh, maybe you are creating social media uh, blasts out of uh, your uh, static con your, your blog content, right? Maybe I don't know. You're doing a bunch of stuff, right? So in this case, you can have your input pass into multiple chains and transformations, and then come back in, and you can combine multiple chains together for one output. Right, and then the, the third type, which is really really cool, is a router chain. So um, many of us have found issues with hallucination inside of LMs. There's some uh, large language models that are, are better than others, and uh, and some some language models that are not as good at certain tasks. You can actually route between them, right? So in this case, you had provide your input, which may be your, your query, right? And the, 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 the router chain itself looks at the input, and there's multiple ways they can handle this. Um, but the simplest way, it actually looks at the words you use and matches that to what is the appropriate chain. So in this case, we defined a mathematics chain and a quality engineering chain, right? So the, um, if we put in saying, OK, um, I, I need to uh, make 2 times 2 and then raise that to the fourth power, right? The, depending on the LM, it may totally screw up the map. You can define in your route in your router chains effectively a personality in that system prompt. It says um, you are extraordinary. You're, you're you're a math chain, right? And then you can connect in that chain. You can point it back in that L in that in that in that LM prompt. You can point it back to uh, a specific router or excuse me a specific model. Maybe Wolfram Alpha or maybe LM Math which is high optimized and really good at mathematics. On the flip side, you can maybe throw a question again. You're like, oh, 
hey, uh, I, I I have an instant response that that is, that is happening, and um, my my engineers are stuck. Right, here's what's happening. What are my next steps? Boom, that's a quality engineering change. You know, Eastern Reliability Engineering for Oracle Cloud for Generation One and Generation Two. Um, things like this happen all the time during an incident. You can pat, you can use your router chains to go ahead and pass to not only specific prompt templates, but if uh, if you've again augmented those uh, those LMs with uh, internal process documents, run books, stuff like that. You can give it some really good information that can help that can help your engineers uh, get, your, get your customers back online. So those are chains. Talk a little about retrieval augment generation. So Lane Chain supports 50 plus document loaders. You can load in uh, PowerPoint, PDF. Um, there's uh, been uh, GPT-4 got updated to support multimodal capability. So images, um, tables, I think sound too. Um, and so you can actually, you can look in, in graphs and tables and PDFs, a bunch of really cool stuff. It's growing more and more every day. Um, it supports about 10 different text splitters. Text splitters, the way that you have to, when you're taking a big document, you kind of have to break it apart and you have to identify where the concepts are breaking apart. Um, a lot of the fun in, in, in RAG is playing with your splitters and making sure you're presenting the right information up to the models, uh, as well as um, effectively being cognizant of how much, uh, how many tokens you're using, right? so how much it's going to cost, but also um, how, how 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 spread apart the focus of your model is, and that's called your context window. Um, so link chain supports uh, over ten vector stores now, more and more every day, and and in five different retrievers. Um, so fundamentally, with the rag, uh, there is this notion of pulling a URL, a document, or a database, breaking that up, right, splitting it, throwing it. Um, into uh, a vector store, and how it actually throws it in there. How these large language models work is um, they they store data in vectors. So, and what, what's a vector? And I need a better slide for this. Note to self, right? A vector is a distance between space and time. So, if I was going to say the concept of the path to my candle, there is through my half dead plant. I'm traveling too much. It died. And it hops to my Polaroid camera, and then it goes to Alien One, the my astronaut, my rock, my cigars, and to my candle. Right. So that's the path through space and time. Uh, words and concepts are represented in that same place, distance and uh, direction or angle. Right. And so I might have the same path. I go from plant to camera to rock, to alien, to astronaut, to cigars, to, to candle. And so the similarity in them are one of the things that we use to identify where similar concepts are. It's a really powerful way uh, of understanding information. So we, we stick our data in our storage using vectors, right? And then the flip side, we pull it out when we're, re when we're retrieving it, when we're querying this new type of database, we ask it a question, right? It pulls from the vector store, looks for the relevant, identifies the relevant chunks of information they're hiding in there, passes that to the prompt, the prompt that we gave it a personality, combines that with that LM and out comes the answer, right? That's magic. This is one of the hottest, most fun, fun areas of large language models. And uh, I'm very encouraged to see all of you doing this. Again, we'll be going over uh, RAG in, in, yeah, I guess in depth, I don't know. Um, but we're doing a, our, our in-person workshop on the 10th, um, excuse me, 17th, no, 17th on, on next Wednesday. So I encourage all of you to join and go deeper. Uh, next concept to talk about is agents. So agents themselves are like little robots. You think of agents from uh, Mr. Smith from the Matrix, right? Uh, they are independent entities, uh, in, in a sense, capable of thought, more of autonom automatons. Um, they have access to tools. Uh, these tools may be the ability to read a database, to write data, to connect to the internet, to pull information, to talk to another agent, to connect and do like a Kafka bus, right? Um, your tools are reusable and composable and you can share them with people, pretty cool, or uh, you can share them with each other. Um, fundamentally, your agents are a combination of a large language model, uh, the code you write, 
memory, which we'll go into and we'll explore a little bit more in our first lab, uh, and the tools you provided to you. Um, this is the future. Um, this is this is heck. This is what I'm building my business around, right? Ongoing agents that augment uh, mine, my partners, my employees' work. LangServe itself, we talked a little bit of it. Um, LangServe is a really cool trick, um, thanks to the LangChain team, that bundles Python code um, and bundles it behind a uh, AI microservice, um, basically a little web service that you can connect to. What this allows us to do is define agents or functions, uh, AI functions, and have them addressable publicly or privately and build a multi-tiered multi application. The um, uh, LangServe itself uh, for your local development, uh, it has a command line interface and makes it really easy to pull down a template for um, local development, uh, but also to insert into your AI microservice uh, management workflow, right? You know, this is really, really new. We're all running with scissors here. So, you know, production is, is definitely what you're going to use it for. Uh, smaller businesses, it's easier. Larger businesses, you're going to have to have more controls around it. Um, but one really cool thing that LangServe al allows you to do is start to get an operational process around managing and deploying, editing, and sharing um, your LangChain templates. Um, it allows for super easy templating, super duper easy templating, both for creating new ones, but also for downloading ones and editing it. Uh, there is so many templates out there, and it's growing more every day. Um, and it creates this API service layer. So, you know, we've dealt with microservices a lot over the past decade. Um, it is a really good way of establishing control um, there. It allows us to break our AI code into small components. And so we can start to establish a software supply chain uh, for our uh, for AI agents. We can establish provenance um, and most importantly, control. You know, so being able to go ahead and improve a, P a PR to be able to um, inject uh, this AI development process into mature software development process allows us to have auditable applications um, that we can actually run our business on and hopefully won't overthrow us in the future. Okay. Doop. Next. Uh, next we have LangSmith. Uh, LangSmith is a web interface. Uh, there's a beta out there. If you have problems getting on the beta, reach out. Um, uh, Harrison shared code with us that we can share with you. Um, it's really, really cool tool. Um, not only for debugging, but also for sh for um, editing and tuning um, your um, uh, your prompts. Right. So once your your frameworks are set up, you know the ability to have a normal business user pop into a simple web inter interface and just play, right, and improve and get feedback. I think is really, really powerful. Uh, and so LangSmith uh, is a really fast growing platform for uh, the management and uh, maintenance and improvement of our AI code. And I encourage everyone to try it. Um, it provides both functional and non-functional information. So you got like latency, um, you get, um, especially if you're building an agent, uh, it gives you a visibility into the maybe the 130 different runs it took to get to your answer. Uh, especially if it's gonna get stuck on stupid somewhere, it gives you a lot of good visibility. You don't have to use it. Um, you can use like a pretty event handler. You can you can log locally. You can pop it into Loki. You do a lot of cool stuff. Um, I personally see both all these things coming together to provide um, uh, I don't know the, a way of actually making all this stuff work. Um, and uh, it is easily added to LangChain code as an environmental variable. So again, wrapping this up, uh, LangChain itself is a project that is open source. And it's free. Um, you can use it yourself. Uh, it, it it abstracts a bunch of large language models out there. Um, it it provides you with a set of retrievers to allow you to pull data into your code. Uh, it has a tooling that allows you to uh, manage, maintain, and improve agents that do things on their own. There's an abstraction language, LangChain expression language, that allows you to simply chain stuff together and do really complicated stuff in not a lot of code. Um, there's the ability through LangServe to pull down templates, uh, use a command line interface, or you can just copy them out yourself if you want. And then uh, for the ability to look at how your application is, is performing, to be able to tune it and improve it, 
Um, there's a really cool platform called LangSmith uh, that they've been developing. And you know, I'm really thankful for the LangChain team uh, for not only um, doing uh, putting together LangSmith and LangServe, uh, but continuing to improve the project. You know, I see uh, Harrison checking. I think there's a doc update that's uh, in a PR right now um, that he wrote himself. So you know, it's a really active project. Really happy. On that note, let's get into some labs. Okay. First, uh, for those of all you all that don't have an open AI key, you need one. Oh, I need to share my browser window, not my thing. So uh, what I want you to do is to go to openai.com and I'm going to share window. There it is. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to log in to, to OpenAI. Well, as it's being slow, I'll continue with Google for me. Sign in however you want. I'm going to go with my open source account. Anyone needs to contact me. That's my work one. That's my personal. I try to reply in the email. But On Slowpoke. Okay, so we want to click on. Let's ignore that. Uh, want to click on our API. And oh, they changed the location. Uh, API keys. And you can create a new secret key, right? So. Be chain one one. Let's see the key. Now y'all can see this. I'm going to go ahead and click done and delete that key because people do bad things. Okay. Now they have your key. Now I want you to save that. I keep it in a password manager. Feel free to revoke your keys whenever. No, please don't put your keys in your source code. Um, there's ways of avoiding this. Uh, you can environmental variables. We're, we're going to be stuffing them inside of uh, a little uh, password manager in Google Cloud. Um, put them in your source code. If you, if you check them in, especially if you upstream them, uh, they will be immediately grabbed by scripts and exhausted and drained. Uh, the default for OpenAI is, I think, 10 and 20. So you get a warning at 10 bucks and it, it cuts off at 20 bucks. So the worst thing that's going to happen is going to be out of a little money. Um, but you know your keys are money, so you know take care of your wallet. Oops. Okay. Slideshow. Get that going again. Why is this full screen? Okay, we're, we're just going to go forward. Okay. Um, so next, what I want you to do is click on your notebook, which is your intro to LangChain. Now, what I have, if you go into the uh, takeaways, there should be a link that's uh, to, lab, to lab one, which is a direct link to the cloud. If you're in our, um, in our repo, trying a moment to load up. You can go to the IPYMB file, and this is a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, for those that are new, the Jupyter Notebooks are um, basically a way to run Python in a notebook. They're used a lot to discuss concepts in, in data science and machine learning. Uh, really, really powerful. Um, think of them like a run book. So there's an open in collab button on here. So if you click the, the link directly under lab one in the takeaways, it should take you directly to here. For those that are in the in in the repo, just click on that. We are going to get. This is going to open up a tool called Google Collab. Um, Google Collab is a hosted interface for these Jupyter notebooks. Uh, it is there's a free tier. Uh, I pay the ten bucks a month, so I get access to some of their GPUs. Um, but the free tier is plenty good. What I want you to do here for the first first thing is I want you to go file and save a copy in your drive. Now, if you don't use Google, if you don't have a Google account. Oh, well, you're one of those, uh, one of the few people. So create one. Uh, we're going to go ahead and save a copy in our drive. Now, this is something now you can edit directly in your Google Drive. You know, you can go, you can go into our repo, and you know, you can clone the repo. You can do whatever if you're super advanced. But 
now we'll have, let's change that to local copy of my chain introduction. And then we'll get word tune out of the way and close these release notes. Okay. So now we have a local copy in your drive that you can play with wherever you want. Really, really cool. So in our introduction, we want to do a couple of things. So the first thing we want to do is inside this interface, anything in black here, this is actually a command you can enter. When there's a play button next to it, you can press that, and it's going to go ahead and execute that. There's another way you can do it, too. You can highlight this so it's a little blinking, and you can do Shift, Enter, and it's going to execute it. And you just hit, hit shift enter all the way down, right? And it'll execute the entire thing. Now, also, if you're having any problems with your, with your notebook, you can go ahead and do a couple of things. So one, here, disconnect and delete runtime is probably the, the most powerful thing. So this is hosted up at Google. Sometimes things get gummed up. You can throw it away. You can try something else. So let's go ahead and connect. You see it's connecting to a Python 3 Google Compute Engine back in. Boom, I'm connected. How cool is that? Again, if you have any problems, just here, disconnect and delete. OK. Now what we're going to do is we're going to press play here. I'm going to talk you through. So what's pip? Um, it's a Python uh, package manager. right? So again, Python notebook. We're saying pip, please install quietly so we don't have a lot of log messages. Three pack or four packages here. We got Langchain, which is the software that comes from the Langchain team. We have OpenAI, which is the Python, the Python code that you use for connecting to OpenAI on the back end. We have Cohere and TikToken. Um, and there's I have I have latest. I don't have specific versions in here, so Thomas Melendez might complain. Um, but I think we should be all right. Um, next, what I want you to do is I want you to go into your secrets. So there's a little key right here. Boop. Click secrets. Now, I want you to add a new secret and type in openai underscore API underscore key. Now, I already have this defined here. And then I want you to paste in your key. Paste in your key, right? Now, when you save this, I, I can't create this, so we're going to actually call this underscore key. And you can turn it on oops, and off. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just delete this because I already have one defined, my OpenAI key. And I'm going to turn this off. Now, just for fun, I'm going to turn on my Langsmith stuff. You won't. We won't see it right now. We might we might show it to you in the future. Okay, now when you have your OpenAI key defined, there's the only one you have to worry about, and it's turned on. Just close that. This all these keys now are going to save inside your collab account. So anytime you're going through uh, an online learning or a class, you'll be able to connect into your um, connect from that key store and pull in your Python code. So next, we want to import Langchain packages. So what's importing a package, right? Um, the basically, when we install Langchain, uh, it's it's it has a bunch of folders inside of it, and inside these folders uh, and subfolders is software that you can load up into your Python code. In this case, your notebook, but maybe inside of your your uh, AI microservice if you're using when we're using Langsmith. So we're going to do a base callback handler. It's basically a way to talk to from Langchain. Right from uh, the chat models, so a folder of the Langchain project. We're going to import chat open AI. This is going to allow us to talk in a in a normal language interface to the to the large language model to the chat optimized model of open AI. And then uh, we're going to import a schema called chat message. So it's going to uh, allow us to effectively uh, uh, pass a large message to it in have like memory. Press play. We see the green checkbox. It means things are good. So next, we're going to get the OpenAI underscore API underscore key from Collab Secrets. That is right here. Now I'm going to turn this off just to show you something. So you don't even have to turn it on manually in that key. We're going to press play. Here, let's open this. Press play here. So from grant access, boop, turn on automatically. How cool is that? 
right? So from google.collab, that's what we're in here, right? Import user data. So this is our user data here, right? And the OpenAI, uh, OpenAI underscore API key, the lowercase version that we use in our code, is going to equal the user data of the uppercase API key, which we define here. So we're going to basically bring that in there. Um, if it's there, we're going to say, uh, uh, excuse me, if it's not there, we're going to say it's not found. And if it is there, we're going to say it's found. What do you know? OpenAI key was found in Collab Secret. So we're going to come move a little further down. We're going to create a, a lane chain object named LLM, right? And we're going to make it uh, for the OpenAI's chat interface, right? And we're going to pass in to this chat interface the key that we just defined up in the little keychain here. Right? So press play. It's basically saying there's the API key that we're going to we're going to connect to uh, ChatGPT or GPT4 back in ChatGPT. Um, looks like we got some deprecated. It should work. I don't know. Uh, note to self, we should add specific versions. There's been a a, um, a refactoring of, of Langchain code and split between stable and experimental. So um, hopefully that should work. Okay, next we're going to create an object. We're going to create a messages object, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to, it's basically a list, right? It's, think of it like just writing, a, if we're going to write a, take our notes in the meeting, right? Um, we're going to put the first message in this message object, and it's going to tell the AI that it's an assistant, and that how, and we're going to prompt it to be like, "Hey, you're an assistant, and you need to ask how may I help you." So it's going to kind of tell it to be helpful. Boop. Okay, that worked. Now we are going to go ahead and define a prompt. When we press play here, you notice a window, right? Oh no, speaking. Healthy things, stevia, may, or zevia makes a great root beer. I highly recommend it. Not, it's not full of bad stuff that will kill you. So now we need to do like, okay, um, what's a prompt? What can we ask our LLM? Hmm. Well, we can ask it it's questions about our universe, right? So we're like, hey, um, how many moons orbit? Saturn. Now we're now we're going to append this message, this prompt, content prompt, content prompt. We're going to say this is from a user. We're going to pass it a chat message, and we're going to append it to this messages object. Basically, we're just going to add it to the list. Now we're going to look at messages, and we can see that the first thing we told it was, "How may I help you?" Right, and then we asked, "How many moons orbit Saturn?" And the role as user. So now let's take this, take messages, pass it to the LLM, and see what response comes out of it. Okay, Saturn has 82 known moons as of 2021. However, new moons are continuously being discovered. So this number may change in the future. Now, if you see there's AI message, there's content, there's some other stuff, we can basically pull just the content from this response. Oop. And we can see that Saturn has 82 moons. So this is a very, very simple ex example of how you can, um, uh, how, how we can interact with the application. So now let's take this response and add it back to this little list of notes that we call messages and append it. Now, there's this concept when we're making our code, right, of, of giving, an, giving AI code memory. Now, how we give it memory is we store it in an object, we write it in a file, we throw it in a vector store, in this case, the messages object. So let's go back up to prompt six. We asked it how many moons orbit Saturn. Say, well, how many of these moons could support life? Go ahead and append that to messages. We'll display what we have. Now, as you can see, messages has our initial prompt, as we told it was an assistant, our initial question, the answer that came from it, and, our, and, and the additional question. Now, because we're appending this to messages, every we're gonna pass this entire thing up to the LLM. And this is kind of how you give, how you give a, a large language model memory, effectively. Let's get its response. 
And let's pull just the content out for easy. As of now, there's no scientific essence that the moons could support life. The conditions required for life as we understand it, so stable atmosphere, liquid water, a source of energy, not present in the moons. However, future missions and discoveries may reveal more about the potential for life. Let's add it again. And I want to do one more follow-up thing because I talked a little about water. And I'm really curious. There we are. Ooh, okay. Um, that's nice. Always be nice to your LM, so maybe our fossils in the future. Um, how many of these moons are suspected to hold water? Ask that again. Think, think. You see, now we have this entire discussion, right? We're giving it context. We're giving it. Um, we're, we're we're enriching it, right? And so this is the kind of game is minimizing or is is how much data can you pass up to your model how much can it see let's pull the response and um several saturn's moons are suspected to have subsurface oceans or contain significant amounts of water water in Enceladus and titan are the two most notable moons in this regard um there's geysers on Enceladus in the south pole indicating the presence of a subsurface ocean titan on the other hand has lakes and rivers of liquid methane and ethane on it um, all sorts of good information. So this is a little, and we'll go ahead and append this response. Um, what I wanted to do here was show you a couple concepts. One, look at how many lines of code here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. In 19 lines of code, we wrote an application that we are querying large language model in a way where it's not training on our data. It's going through the private interface. This functions. This is a little robot. This is a little AI robot. This is the core of it. And this is the power of LangChain is that it allows you to do this. Start in a notebook, but again, as we go forward, we'll show you how to do this in our Docker containers in, um, in, our, in our later classes. Okay, on that note, I am going to switch back over to this and hand it off to Ricky Perusio. It's gonna take us through some really cool stuff of how to create some web services. Ricky, will you, I'm gonna make you, give you a spotlight here. Take myself out of it. We take Can everyone hear me? Hammer. I'm clear. Awesome. Let me just share my screen. Small screen. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Ricardo Baruccio. I go by Ricky. Um, I live here in the amazing Austin, Texas. Um, I come from a background of uh, a little different from this group. Uh, I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Uh, I've worked in manufacturing for all my career. Started out in aerospace, transitioned into semiconductor equipment manufacturing with applied materials. Um, and uh, currently working in supply chain um, and actually uh, bringing uh, this knowledge uh, into my work. A um, little over like a year ago, I started, uh, I was in the coding bootcamp. I was really interested in getting into software. Uh, so I learned JavaScript, uh, like React, like learn, uh, building uh, full stack applications. Um, and uh, as well as uh, interacting like databases, uh, relational, not relational, like Mongo, uh, MySQL, Postgres, um, and some neat tricks with like Docker and GitHub Actions. 
uh, really cool experience. Uh, Hack Reactor Galvanize, I was also a tutor at it. Um, and then I actually picked up Python to work in my current job. This was like before LangChain, um, but it became really useful for uh, the present moment. Um, so my interest in LangChain, um, uh, I, manufacturing is cool um, to apply these concepts to. I think there's a lot more useful things out there, um, honestly, uh, that uh, we talk about all the time in Discord. Um, so if, if you're not there, uh, definitely check it out. We have really cool conversations about all the different use cases that we can apply to. Um, on the bottom, there's some links in my socials, LinkedIn and GitHub. The QR code right here will take you to my LinkedIn. Um, Community Connect. On that note, we will transition to our second lab. Um, and that is, stop sharing my screen. You should see that on the agenda, uh, the lab two, creating a simple AI microservice with LangChain and Streamlit. Uh, so if you, Click on that collab. Ooh, I guess I shouldn't share my screen. Share my back of my screen. Okay, you should see collab. Um, so the idea for this lab um, is to show you how you can build a AI microservice uh, with Streamlit, integrated with LangChain. So Streamlit is a really cool, uh, you can think of it as a front end framework uh, for, uh, for, uh, for working with Python. Um, it makes building UIs with Python like extremely easy. It's it's used a lot by data scientists, uh, machine learning uh, enthusiasts, lane chain enthusiasts, um, and uh, it's really popular nowadays uh, for creating chatbots. Um, so here you can see we will first uh, down uh, install packages, uh, install a pip install uh, streamlet. You just gotta click on this collab uh, play button right here. Uh, don't forget to connect to uh, your uh, your runnable. Um, so you you press this button. I already have it pre-installed. Um, and oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. <laughs> so we're, we're 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 starting with the this is the one for the the microservice. Um, which should it, let me see if that link brought you here. Okay, yes, this is the correct one. So um, you start out with installing packages and then you just run your application right here. Now, uh, pull out that uh, uh, OpenAI uh, API key, just keep it handy real quick because we're going to be using it in just a minute. Um, this is our entire application for this chatbot. Uh, 40, about 40 lines of code. This is all you need to build a chatbot uh, that can interface with an LLM. We're using GPT-4 in this case from OpenAI. Um, and there's really like three parts of this code. Uh, you have a sidebar a message history, and then a way to interface with your chat uh, for a user as well as a, uh, an LLM. So we will dive into um, the actual UI so you can see exactly what this outputs. Now, after you run, ran this command to uh, write this file, uh, you can run this command right here. Uh, that will run 
uh, the file on a uh, on a local host um, server. Uh, so you um, after clicking this, you will click this other command right here, just outputs your IP address. Uh, and then there's this MPX command, uh, which we can use to tunnel in our streamlet um, runnable into this local tunnel. So this basically outputs your code to the internet. Put this side by side. And this is why we need the, the IP address. So we can put it right here. And there you go. This is our UI. Now, the sidebar here is going to ask you for an OpenAI API key. So uh, you can get your API key and you can place it here. And then you can start chatting. Um, let's see, it is link chain. Cool. So it's working. So uh, going back to the code, I said uh, earlier, there's three parts to this. You have a sidebar with just two lines of code that we made right here. And then you have the message history, which uh, this is basically the record of our chat. Uh, and then you have a way to interact with the the chat. So a user um, has the role user right here, uh, outputs a, inputs a message, um, and then an LLM right here uh, responds to that message. And we, we're using the stream handler right here to uh, basically as like middleware between our LLM uh, in our chat. And that's pretty much it. This is all it took to create a chatbot with OpenAI um, as the LLM layer um, and Streamlit as our UI interface. It's pretty cool. So now that we have that, uh, we, we talked about a uh, how to how to build this uh, kind of like an overview how to how to use Streamlit to to build the uh, this like AI mi microservice. Um, but let, let's let's do a deeper dive on actually like using Streamlit. Um, so that will be on the second part of the agenda. So the lab three. Um, you should see the link to the collab there and it should take you to this notebook. So same thing, make sure you're connected to your, uh, to your uh, uh, runnable. Um, and then you can install Streamlit again, I already installed it. So then you can press this button right here. It will write this code right here to the streamline app.py file. Um, and this is basically to show you how to build a simple, extreme, like, super bare bones, like Streamlit application. 
So once you do that, you save this to the streamlinapp.py file. You can go all, all the way in the bottom here. Um, and we're basically going to execute the same set of commands that we did on the last notebook uh, to output our application. Going to put it side by side. And there you go. So everything on this page is uh, static. There's, there's no user interaction here. We just added a title uh, right here, uh, a header, uh, which is kind of like a title, um, some text, more text right here. We just SC that right. Um, we outputted a number. And then uh, we did the same thing down here in a slightly different way. So um, these are kind of like static elements you can think of, like sc.tags, sc.header. It's kind of how you use like Markdown, if you're familiar with it. Um, that's kind of what it reminds me of. sc.write can basically render anything on the, on the page. Um, but you could also just get the literals straight up and, and just have them on your code and it will render exactly as you would using sc.write. So you don't actually need to use sc.write to do this. Uh, now, if we wanna make our app a little bit more interactive, um, we will go to this next part of our code. So we will overwrite that streamline app.py file. Let me stop this first. Going through the same set of commands. Now, our app is more interactive. You can see here how we have text input boxes. We have these uh, check boxes. Uh, we have the button that we can use to submit our um, input. Um, and this is basically uh, these, these elements for this. This is what Streamly calls widgets. Um, so it's like uh, uh, sc.txt input um, or the button, sidebar.button. Um, and they're called widgets because they're interactive elements. Um, at least that's how Streamlit uh, sort of looks at it. Um, now here we're not capturing state. Uh, State is basically um, how you can capture user information or user interaction um, and uh, persist it uh, between re-renders. Um, so Streamlit is, um, is a server-side render. So um, it will be rendered on your server. Um, once that is rendered, it will be outputted to your client. Um, but when your client interacts with it, uh, what happens is that it goes back to the server, uh, render, re-renders the application, and then outputs it to the client again. Um, and the, again, the way we persist uh, use interaction is with session state. Um, so pretty important concept for uh, just uh, UI development in general. Uh, you might be familiar with that if you're coming from JavaScript world with React. Uh, basically same thing. So uh, we will show this on the next section. Talk about the concept of state. 
going through the same set of commands. Use our code. And here you can see uh, our widgets again. We can enter name. We can enter some text. We press this button, do that. We can increment this counter. You see this object down here, and this is basically our session state object, um, which is what is getting updated uh, between re-renders, right? Is our session state. Um, session state, you can, uh, you can initialize it just like a regular uh, dictionary uh, in Python. You can use bracket notation, you can use dot notation. Um, here you have a widget that you can use to initialize it as well. Uh, all you gotta do is just pass it a key. And then you can uh, update your state with these callbacks that you define. So it's pretty neat, uh, super simple. Uh, let's move on to caching. We ran that. There you go. So caching. Um, our goal here is to basically store uh, expensive function outputs um, so we don't we don't need to run that function uh, more than once, essentially. Uh, it's kind of self-explanatory with the code. Um, here we have some expensive computation is like our expensive function. Um, here we are, we're calling that expensive computation um, and basically passing in a number. So if I pass one right here, you will see this thing run. And that is basically simulating expensive computation. Now, I kind of, I kind of just uh, cheated here a little bit. Uh, just to, for example, I put it like a, a time to sleep function, which basically waits like three seconds uh, before executing the uh, result here. Um, that's kind of to simulate expensive computation. Uh, what's actually doing the caching though is this decorator with this this at symbol with this uh this function right here that's called decorator in python and decorator is basically used to wrap functions so uh, what happens is that the first time you run this function the expensive computation gets stored uh, in the cache um, and so if i see if i do two now it's going to take three seconds to run because it hasn't seen that number yet. But if I go back to one, you will see that it rendered on the screen right away because uh, uh, Streamline just pulled that uh, number straight from the cache instead of running this computation. So that kind of just shows you, uh, you know, how you could apply this to an LLM response. Like maybe you, uh, you have a users like asking kind of the same questions over and over again. Um, and 
you know, you don't, you will kind of want to free up resources um, from your server. You can cache those responses and then um, output them to your users right away. Uh, so it's, that's kind of our use case for caching. Uh, many other use cases out there, but basically the gist is that you're storing some expensive computation memory. Now this uh, kind uh, still sh shows caching. Our next example right here, simulating caching and LLM response. Let's go through this again. The idea is that next example is that uh, this looks like just, this is a chat. Um, so I wanted to show you how uh, this kind of looks like on uh, with, within a chatbot application. Uh, 35 lines of code is all you need. Um, we have our expensive computation here, which is like a response from an LLM. Uh, we have our chat history uh, that we're using interacting with session state. Uh, whoops. And then we have here our interface uh, with the chat. So we can, the chat here, you will have this little human icon and then you can see that uh, the LLM response right here with this little robot emoji. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but it there was like a spinner on it. Uh, that took some time. Let's do another one. Yo, you can see a little spinner icon right there, uh, simulating the, the expensive computation. And let's say hello again. Ah, you can see the little spinner then show up this time because we got our response straight from the cache. So that's power of caching. Yes, Streamlit, Streamlit automatically creates uh, the emojis, but you can actually uh, pass in whatever emoji you want. So uh, uh, it's really easy to tweak that. Um, and that's pretty much it for this lab. I actually uh, recently uh, did something like this for my job. Um, I didn't use an LLM um, to, to respond to users uh, because uh, the, the, the responses were basically like either A or B, kind of something like that. Um, and uh, I was able to, use, to build an entire application uh, kind of just like automating some uh, um annoying like data computation stuff uh that uh, uh my colleagues were doing um and they kind of wow some people too so that was pretty cool um but yeah that's basically the power of streamlet uh again like not a lot of code uh super intuitive if you just like read the documentation um there it, it's really straightforward um even with like little python experience uh, um, so I, I highly encourage you guys to use it. And uh, oh, with thank... that, yeah, kick it off to Kareem. Absolutely. Uh, first, before we do that, uh, if, I'm going to click on, can you answer a question that Catherine, it should popped up on everyone's screen. Do you see that? Do you see the question, Ricky? Yeah. Can you build a Streamlit app that isn't publicly visible on the web, yeah, yeah. So uh, whenever you're developing this, um, it will be hosted on your own local machine. So you see like a local host, uh, forgot what the port number was, it was like 85, oh, 8501 right here. Uh, I'm not sure anymore, but yeah, 8501 um, is the port. Uh, and that's why we, we mapped that into our, uh, our local tunnel earlier. So we, we were mapping the, our uh, local uh, collab instance to the worldwide web through that uh, 
8501 port. But yeah, you can run that on your own local infrastructure on your own laptop or whatever. You can have it privately available. And you know, as we go through later on in later meetings and um, our building interfaces for our LangServe applications, um, it's a great, great use case of how that is completely controlled. Uh, Ricky, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your positive attitude and contribution Pleasure. to the project. Awesome. Thank you so much. You I learned so much. Cool. On that note, I uh, want to hand it on over to Mr. Kareem Lalani. Kareem, you want to talk a little bit about yourself and steal this, uh, steal this back and show us some cool stuff? Sure, absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, this, uh, you know, joint learning session. Um, Colin, Ricky, and I, we believe in sharing what we learned, you know, and learning together. This is something that, uh, you, you know, uh, is ingrained in our uh, philosophy uh, and behind, you know, essentially what motivated Colin to start the, uh, the meetup and, and these sessions. Um, I am a software engineer. I have been developing software for, for over 16 years now. I've worked with a lot of different frameworks uh, and programming languages. I've coded for the back end, for the front end, mobile apps, um, and um, did a little bit of uh, DevOps. Uh, and lately, my passion has been sort of getting my you know getting lost within oh there's a qr code issue no worries um my my, my linkedin should be easy to uh, easy to find uh, we, we'll we'll get that uh, fixed catherine thanks for uh, uh thanks for pointing that out and my interest in lang you know in large language models and lang chain is essentially more on the open source side i'm mostly interested in you know finding and, and and discovering ways by which we can take the power and promise of large language models and artificial intelligence uh, applications built using those models to uh, small and medium sized businesses um mostly around you know i'm i'm mostly I, you know, you'll find me mostly dabbling in the open source side of things, uh, not as much with uh, the hosted services like um, uh, OpenAI and Anthropic. Uh, reason being, you know, uh, there's you know, there's a lot of use cases where you might want to host a model locally. It, it could be because you know you have a niche use case, uh, maybe you know the uh, ongoing uh, costs uh, might not be um, justified uh, for your specific use case. Um, maybe you have data privacy concerns. Maybe there's an alignment uh, concern. You know, um, the answers that are provided by these large language models, they meet a certain bias. And maybe those biases, you know, maybe you don't want those biases to creep into your responses to, to the applications that you build for your um, personal use or for your applications that, that you build for your organizations or, or, or any application that you build for, uh, for everybody else to consume. Um, maybe you want to hedge your bets against, uh, you know, uh, these changing market conditions, uh, changing situations uh, with, uh, you know, boards of directors deciding one day to get rid of a key figure and then uh, in, in a couple of days, finding themselves out of a job. Um, so it could it could be any number of reasons. Um, so that's where you know I find you know you'll you'll find me mostly um, uh, looking into. And um, the other thing that that I'm most I'm interested in most is to identify ways to deploy these uh, language models. Now, one of the advantages of going with the hosted service like OpenAI is your infrastructure footprint is quite low. You're typically just building, essentially just building 
small applications that are consuming, you know, they're offloading this uh, computations um, to OpenAI, to Anthropic, to Google, uh, et cetera. But when you are hosting your own language model, you have to, uh, there are certain considerations in mind that you have to think about what kind of infrastructure you need, how many GPUs you might need to source. Uh, you might have to get creative about different, um, uh, you know, in, uh, infrastructure uh, concerns. Uh, there might be security concerns that you might uh, have to now take on uh, yourself. Um, having said that, um, I think um, let's let's jump right into the labs, and and this this lab builds on top of what you've seen so far. Uh, the first lab that uh, Colin introduced, uh, where we saw how to um, build an, a, a simple application in Python um, using Langchain that can communicate with an uh, with OpenAI. And you could communicate with any language model for that matter. Uh, but then we saw Ricky put a streamlit application around that and make it presentable, make it usable. You don't expect your users to log into a um, Google Collab and run applications uh, the way uh, Colin demonstrated. That was that was purely for educational purposes uh, or. Um, you know, if that is the environment you work in, you're familiar with, then then that might uh, make sense. But even then, you saw how easy it is to create um, a neat looking application with Streamlit. Uh, and it builds on top of the previous work that um, previous lab that Colin uh, showed. Uh, so in that same um, theme, we this this new lab, will show you how to switch out OpenAI with a self-hosted model. Uh, now, the thing about self-hosting a model, uh, models by themselves are inert. They are just binary blobs of files. You can't do anything with them. But you know, in order to work with them, you need something that's you know, called an inference engine. Uh, OpenAI is providing that to, you know, is providing, letting you use their inference engine through the use of their APIs. Um, but when you're uh, running, when you want to host your own um, language models locally, then you need to do it with the help of an inference engine. And for this exercise, I mean, you, there, there's multiple inference engines out there. Um, the one that we will use with this exercise is called um, Olama. And we will also be using the uh, Mistral seven billion uh, parameter model. It's a small model. Um, it is small enough to where a free Colab instance will let you run it. So having said that, uh, let's uh, dive right into the lab. Uh, let me go ahead and share. Our screen. That's the one, actually. Let's do it this way. Perfect. OK. So as you can see, um, uh, is my screen share visible? Per OK, great. Awesome. So again, you'll find this flow very similar to uh, the past presentations, the, uh, the previous labs. Uh, we start by installing uh, Langchain and Streamlit. In this case, you'll notice uh, an omission here, OpenAI is not included here uh, because we won't be connecting to OpenAI's APIs. Uh, we have uh, the source code um, here and I'll go through the source code uh, here in a minute. Um, the next thing we do is after we save uh, the source code, we download and run the Olama binary um, and we ask Olama to download Two models for us. Now we only need one model for this present uh, for this lab, but to demonstrate that you know you yes you can do more than one model, so you can host them locally, um, so long as your infrastructure um, is capable. Uh, in this case, we are downloading Mistral and uh, Llama two, both of them big seven billion uh, parameter models. We will start Streamlit. At this point, we are already running Olama, which is serve which is serving as um, Mistral and Ola, uh, and Llama 2 through its own API. We are 
and then running the application that we just um, uh, saved here uh, through, st uh, through Streamlit. And then we will open up a local tunnel because Google Collab is, is not meant to be used this way. You're not meant to run applications using Google Collab. We are just using a hack here. Uh, we are running the applications backgrounded, and then we are doing a, a local tunnel through well, uh, this utility called local tunnel, which will give you a easy to access um, three word URL, where once you go there, uh, you provide the host IP address to verify, and then it'll expose the application uh, through it. Now, for uh, for the purposes of this lab, I went there and I did that beforehand because, uh, as it turns out, downloading two models that are four gigabytes each will take a couple of minutes. But let's uh, let's go through the code uh, quickly uh, before I show you the application again. First thing we're doing, we are bringing in our imports. Uh, in this case, uh, the uh, one of note is chat Olama. This was what you previously saw as um, chat open AI. So instead of using chat open AI, we are using chat, uh, chat Olama. And chat Olama is, again, a chat model uh, interface that is available through LangChain. We didn't have to install anything other than, you know, you, you saw that we only installed LangChain and Streamlit. Uh, this comes prepackaged with uh, the latest uh, Langchain library. We are uh, using the human message and AI message uh, schemas for um, distinguish, you know, dis differentiating between the messages that we are passing to the la language model versus what it'll return back to us. Um, um, we'll maintain that in memory. We are using a URL lib uh, request package and JSON packages, and I'll I'll go over why. Uh, shortly, and then of course we have our streamlit package here. First call you'll notice here is a get olama model call. It is decorated with a cache resource. Ricky uh, a few minutes ago mentioned about uh, caching, long running op operations. In this case, we will be making calls to the olama API to get a list of models, and we don't want to keep calling that API over and over because that model list is not going to change very often. So we only want to do it once, which is why we've decorated this um, this call with uh, the uh, cache resource uh, decorator. Uh, the first time it sees this call, it will run this computation. It, it's not a very intensive computation, but again, this is a use case where you know if you're running an enterprise level application uh, and you know that the responses are not going to change, but each, each call is, is a, a call over the network. Uh, you want to reduce that. So this would be a, a use case uh, for using a cache resource. We have a stream handler. Uh, again, no need to worry about that. We have a sidebar. In the sidebar, we have a text input where we are uh, asking for your local Olama uh, API, uh, defaulted to localhost 11.434. And uh, a, a select box, which is a drop-down box with a list of the models, and we got the list of the models from this previous call. Once we have that, uh, we have we also have a button to clear chat history. All that will do is it'll clear out any messages that we've stored so far, and it'll reset it back to the first message uh, with the AI essentially asking, "How can I help you?" We initialize the state here. And then everything here that you see is pretty much uh, almost uh, almost verbatim um, with the you know from the OpenAI chat application that uh, Ricky demonstrated you know uh, he showed. Uh, the only difference being uh, we're checking to see if a model is selected, and if it's not selected, then we don't proceed further. Uh, we want to make sure that a model is selected before we can chat with a um, uh, large language model. Now let's see. Uh, going over the questions, why do we need an API call if LLM is downloaded? Okay, and okay. So the reason for that, like I mentioned, the large language model itself is just a binary blob. By itself, it doesn't, uh, it can't, you know, it's it's just a file. Um, we are using Olama's inference engine, and Olama runs locally as a separate application. 
in this instance, it's running. Uh, we we are running it here in this set of calls. When we're downloading it, we are uh, making it an executable, and this Olama serve will essentially run it uh, as a backgrounded application. Um, and one of the things that it does when you do when do Olama serve is it exposes a web service. And the other thing that we're asking it to do is download these two models. The 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 way we will interact with the large language models is through an API exposed by Olama, which is that that's the reason why uh, we are making an API call here. It's it's still an API call to to a local service, but it is still an API call. Um, does that answer your question, uh, Scott? Perfect. So let's switch over. All right, so this is our application. This is, again, the uh, address of the local service that we're running. Now, if you're running in your infrastructure, it, this could be a separate set of servers. It could be a load balanced um, you know, uh, URL with uh, you know, maybe four, five, six instances of uh, servers with GPUs running Olama on it. Uh, in this case, we're connecting to a local instance that is running on the same uh, server as this notebook. This dropdown is showing us the list of models that we downloaded. Again, I didn't pre-populate this. This is coming from the API call um, that was made, and that code is coming from here. It says the select box, and to, the options for that select are coming from this get Olama model function call, which is basically it looks it takes the URL of the Olama server and makes an API call to the API forward slash tags. Um, URL that is uh, endpoint that is being hosted, and from there, you know, it, it gets back JSON uh, response with a list of all the models, and we just extract out the names. And the way to communicate with Olama, um, because it can serve multiple models at the same time, the way you do that is, you know, you specify that in the uh, chat Olama call. We had a chat OpenAI call, uh, which took you know, some of these other uh, parameters, but in chat Olama, because it can host multiple models, we have to tell it which model we are we are looking to communicate with. So we pass it the name of the model, which we which is going to be the currently selected model from this uh, dropdown list. Uh, so let's see, let's see. Uh, give me a list of coolest AI large language models. There it is. It's starting to give us answer. And you'll notice that Mistral is quite humble. It it lists all of these other ones, some of even some of the more obscure ones, but it doesn't list itself. <laughs> um, you know, since we have a second model here, let's go ahead and switch it over. Let me clear out the history and ask it the same question. Um, list. Give me a list of the coolest AI large language models. Again, it gives us a little bit of a disclaimer. It's part of the training that, um, you know, the training data that um, Llama 2 was trained on. And then it goes on in a similar fashion. It gives a list of uh, large language models. Now, how do I know I'm talking to different models? Uh, let's clear out the chat. Now, the reason why I'm clearing out the chat is so that I don't confuse the language models. Um, I can ask it, uh, what is your name? It made something up. Uh, who are you? And this is a hit or okay, there you go. It says I'm Llama, AI assisted developed by Meta AI. And that sounds about right. Um, if I clear this out, let's switch it over. Let's ask Mistral, who are you? And one of the things that I've noticed is in the newer iterations of Mistral, they've actually trained that data, that information out. So it will not answer with its own name. Uh, but these are two separate models that are uh, that are being run locally. 
you can you know you can um, depending on your use case. Um, Colin mentioned about uh, the router chain, where depending on the specific uh, prompt, um, LangChain will just help you determine where to route the the prompt to. Uh, this could be some you know, this could be a perfect use case for that. Now you have multiple language models running, and you can uh, create a routing prompt that will have the a chain point to either OpenAI's GPT-4 or ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo or Llama or Mistral, and two of those models are running locally. And the, that's the end. I, uh, any, any questions? Um, if there's any more questions, okay. In that throw case, in the let queue. me give yeah. the presentation back to Colin. OK. Share a screen. I think you need to stop your share there, Kareem, for me to take it back from you. Reem, can you stop the share on in your um, sessions interface? Hmm. Reem, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Let me turn, let me start spotlight and turn the stop there. Okay, let me kick this back over. Thanks, Kareem, for all the information share. I, I, I learn so much each time, uh, both from you and Ricky. Um, and so I wanna wrap, wrap things up here. So the key takeaways for Langchain, um, this is a fast growing project. As we uh, saw earlier, some of their messages that still work, uh, there's refactoring the code base to like a core and experimental. It's a fast growing project. It's full of integrations. There's so many integrations. One of the things I really respect about Harrison and team is that uh, they structure a project where anyone who wanted to integrate with Langchain could do it quite easily. Um, it is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly um, uh, um, easy to add, add stuff in. Uh, Cream just added in uh, um, a integration in, uh, I believe, uh, right before the end of the year. Um, you know, any of us can do can do this, and uh, I, um, you know, whatever we can do to support everyone who to uh, both writing this code, but also upstreaming code, either to our repo or upstream link chain, like we're here to do it. Um, it is incredibly extensible, uh, whether using it in for private LLMs, whether you're using it for uh, foundation models externally, whether you're using it for public stuff like GPT-4. Um, it, it, it is a Swiss Army knife, uh, and it's growing really fast. It is open. It's open source. It's portable, and uh, it's really accessible. You know, we saw how a uh, few lines of code it really took to get some basic applications going. So I want to go ahead and extend a, a warm thank you. And I see some questions here. And so I'm going to answer the first one here. Uh, does Langchain plan to start charging for Langsmith sometime? I do believe so. They're funded by, by Benchmark, um, the VC. So they want to make money off something. Uh, I don't know what the tiers are going to be. So that is a question I don't know the answer for. Um, we can go ahead and um, reach out to reach out to Harrison either directly on his Twitter, um, or you know uh, I, I'll pop the question uh, in a, like a partner's Slack channel too. Um, and then Blake asked a question of answer live. 
what is the GPU, if any, you are using that returned all that text so quickly? Um, both uh, Kareem and I use uh, pay the ten dollars a month for um, the um, uh, basically like a pro version of Cloud. It makes it so that it won't kick out. Your instance will stay open longer. It gives you um, access to GPUs and some stuff. <clears throat> I, I used the free instance for uh, for my demo today. Oh, use the free instance. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks, Kareem. Um, and on that note, okay, cool. Uh, I want to thank everyone for your participation. I want to thank uh, Kareem and uh, and Ricky for for their work, for their their contributions to the project, for the contributions to the meetup. I want to thank so many of the faces that I recognize from our meetups and all these new faces for all the active participation. You know, we're learning the in the open. We want to stay cool. You know, we're embracing our um, our, our learners' minds. You know, we're being vulnerable out here, and uh, we're moving forward in this really cool uh, AI ecosystem. So, please connect with us. Show up on our Discord. Join the conversation. Uh, feel free to use the GitHub. Uh, our GitHub. Teach us internally. Teach us externally. Share the love. Right. Uh, connect to our meetup. Uh, we do monthly in person. We do remotes as well. Um, and our, again. We want, we want to learn and share to grow together. So thank you so much for all your time. Thanks for all the participation. Um, and uh, thanks for collaboration. Also, kind of put up with the growing pains of using these new platforms. Okay. Again, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. And uh, thank you so much. And we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.